Hi, this is part two of the attempt by Terry Parker to retrieve his marijuana before Justice Tullock, Crown Attorney James Gorham, on February 17, 2009, in uh, Brampton, Ontario. The weakness of the court's logic is evident by the need to use a double negative to create the illusion that something may exist, which probably does not. For instance, Expert doctor, can you swear marijuana does not cause freckles? Well, no, I never heard of it, but I can't guarantee marijuana doesn't cause freckles. So, marijuana may cause freckles, because doctors can't say that it does not, so it might. Doctors can't say marijuana does not cause athlete's foot, so it might. Doctors can't say marijuana does not cause baldness, so it might. And the Hitzig Court of Appeal cannot say that it's practically unavailable, so it might be available. When the number of known epileptics, 400,000, who die of seizures every year, 1,500, is greater than the number of exemptions for all illnesses under 1,000, it must be said that cooperation is at a point where the issue must be revisited. Forcing the appellant to doctor shop in an environment where less than one in a hundred, actually I found out it's one in sixty, doctors participate is an ineffective regime. Accepting the court's double negative is an indication of sufficiency of logic of logic is unsound. Now at this point the crown attorney jumped up when I'm explaining this to the judge and says he's got no evidence that it's one in sixty doctors. And I said, Well, I'm sure I read somewhere it's one in sixty. And then later on, when he got up to do his explanation, he said, there are 400 doctors in Ontario who do these things, therefore it's not unavailable. And I went, whoa, 400 doctors out of 27,000 is 1 in 60, which is what I'm saying. So 1 in 60 isn't a great solution. So the judge construed the Court of Appeals statement, Judge Clements, that anyone who establishes medical need is simply exempt, means anyone who gets an exemption is exempt. Yes, anyone who gets an exemption is exempt, but anyone who establishes medical need is too. Though these issues were brought to the Supreme Court of Canada and the dismissals and abandonments are noted in the appeal book, they were never actually revisited. An appellant seeks an order under Section 24 of the CDSA for the return of the controlled substance. Now, at the same time, in, I got to comment as I'm going along and give background information which is already available on the internet. But um, there's a new angle, a new grounds that came up last year. It was f called the Svetkopoulos case in the federal court. Now, you'll remember back in 2000, Terry Parker got the order that said that uh, the law was unconstitutional. And then the court admitted that it fell, turned off in 2001. But then they said the Hitzig court resurrected it in 2003, a little later. And that, but then two months later, the Hitzig court resurrected it by striking down two bad conviction, uh, conditions that had made the exemption malfunction. Two months later, Health Canada puts those two conditions back in that you cannot grow for more than one person. And But they say, because we supply the pot, that means that's okay. Well, last year, the court ruled that it's not okay. And therefore, when they put those conditions back in, it made the MMAR no good. Again, I called that the gimme. The Health Canada gimme, the mistake, the stupid mistake. So, basically, now, the Crown Attorney then jumped up and said, yeah, but last at the Court of Appeal, they again struck down that condition about not being able to grow for more than one person, and that means it's alive again. So I said to Judge Tullock, you know, do they really mean that the law works this way, the prohibition is alive until 2001, then it turns off for 2,000 years, and it turns on in 2003, October, and then two months later it turns off because they made the mistake again, then five years later, when the mistake is pointed out, it turns back on again? I said, that's the stupidity of courts legislating new laws, or screw-ups. <laughs> but anyway, so Judge Tullock uh, took all the information, and then reserved his decision on it. And uh, we pointed out that the Svetkopoulos case had gone to the Court of Appeal and they'd lost. And they'd attempted to get a stay of proceedings and were refused. Therefore, it has taken effect. 
And we have proof now that the MMAR access regulations, even if the Hitzig court resurrected them in October 2003, they've been dead again since December 2003, with another quarter million bogus convictions under the belts of the judicial system. Congratulations, lawyers at work. So that's it for the Terry Parker case. We're waiting for Justice Tullock's decision. He's a young guy. He might decide if he wants to strike a blow for setting the pot slaves free. There's a lot he could do. He could order the declaration that, yes, the law did not come back alive with Hitzig. He could order that the Pitt decision is still valid because it was not properly set aside. He can order that the Krieger decision is still alive. I mean, still valid, and therefore the prohibition against cultivation is also dead. And he can order the Crown Attorney to stop pro prosecutions against all of these charges until someone overrules him because he's high enough. Wow. So, say a prayer. We get a ballsy judge. But I admit it to him. I know you got an easy way out. You can use the same thing as Justice Clements below and say I'm bound by my bosses, the, the higher court of Ontario, who said they resurrected the law, who tell me to ignore the Interpretation Act, that the law is to be deemed repealed, and to deem it absent, and they fixed it. Now they ain't absent no more. And, you know, so, and to, they told me to accept that Justice Chapnick could set aside Justice Pitt's criminal remedy in civil court because they said it was okay because there was something wrong with service when there is no such thing as a service issue in the superior court with a judge with that kind of power who can exempt service. So all these mistakes he has a chance to set right and take a stand, make hell of a news and, uh, and then after that it's to go up and be right, proven right. So but then again, you can take the easy way out and say I'm bound by my superiors. No, I'm just going to go and appeal through to the top anyway. So and it ended on a kind of funny note because Terry had been pushing for me to show this newspaper article, uh, a big one, a big spread in the Toronto paper about him attacking the medical fraternity for all the illegal experimentation with non-informed consent they'd done on him, tulebectomies and all sorts of tortures, you know, and uh, because that's why he not only has a dread of going to doctors, but why doctors would probably not sign after his constant attacks on the doctors and the area so he wanted and so at the end of the thing I said oh one last thing I said mr. Parker wants to point out that not only is there the dread of the doctors but then I opened up the little article and said but because of this there's little likelihood anyone's gonna want to sign can I hand this in to give you an idea of why he's worried about the 1 in 60 being a lot longer odds for him and the crowd jumped up and said no it's too late for the new evidence and I understood it was but at this point Terry had a chance to say his piece so he got up and he pointed out look it I was a victim of these CIA MK ultra mind control experiments and and they, they really hurt me. And before he got into the rant about how much they hurt him, I interrupted with the winner and said, that's why we're trying to get the judge to force them to make your doctor comply. Because remember, the Crown kept accusing Terry of not going to doctor shop for other doctors. And I told Terry, don't go looking for other doctors with one in 60 answering. It's a ridiculous search. Stand up for the right to make them force your doctor to participate in a legitimate medical program, which is what he did. And that's why I could quickly zing him and say, okay, that's why we want your doctor to be forced. And why Justice Tullock had it accentuated that Terry not only is terrified of going to deal with these butchers, but they won't want to probably give him an exemption anyway, so the odds are even worse for him, almost impossible, and that's why the just answer is for the judge to make Health Canada force the doctor to comply, or at least cut the fear that's in the doctor for complying, because they do scare doctors. I even brought up the Derek Francisco case in the last part to point out how here's a guy with 21 grams of marijuana he's allowed to have in his prescription for the longest time and then after phone calls from Health Canada the doctor suddenly cuts his prescription down to 5 grams. Imagine having your prescription cut by 75% how that affects people. So I pointed out to the judge that you've got guys at Health Canada who are working not only to keep prescriptions 
down, but they're harassing the doctors out there. So how difficult is it going to be to find a doctor for Terry? Very. And so having those extra zingers in there gives the judge an idea of the horrors faced by medical exemptees in their dealings with the narc pharmacists brought over from the Justice Department to the Health Department when they started up the marijuana program. So the narc mole pharmacists could ask the doctors all the questions and check up on them. So anyway, that's basically the story the judges got. Let's hope for a good answer.